pH strata and how it can play a role in reflux management in Switzerland. We're very pleased to be working with LaserMed, who as a company we've worked with for a number of years to bring the DXPH I apologize, uh, I was having a slight technical fault there. I seem to be getting muted <laughs> uh, as, as we proceeded. Uh, so my apologies, but we are very pleased to work with LaserMed uh, to bring this uh, exciting product to the Swiss market. And today I'd like to go through a number of the clinical components of the product and how we feel it can fit into existing practices for reflux management. And really with this product, we're looking at that gap between patients who do not appropriately respond to medicative therapy uh, and patients who don't quite need that anatomy altering surgery that seems to be the other um, opportunity for treatment. Uh, as I proceed, do feel free to ask questions. Uh, there are opportunities both to unmute your microphone and sort of jump right in. And then as well, uh, we have opportunities for you to type questions in the software um, on your screen. I'll do my best to get to those as I can. If there's any that I miss, please do circle back to them at the end of the presentation, and I'll be very happy to address them then. So just to introduce uh, a couple of the points of uh, the PowerPoint today, we're going to look through several observational study from very different institutions in different countries that consistently show how Strata improves patients' good symptoms and quality of life scores. Uh, and this has been uh, validated in a number of ways and with a number of different metrics. Uh, we're also going to look at the meta-analyses that shows very similar results uh, and that show that Strata can produce a significantly reduced acid exposure in the esophagus. Uh, the long-term results of Strata studies are similar to those of missing publications, and we're going to be showing you results from six, eight, 10, and 15-year follow-up studies showing how Strata can be beneficial to specific patient selections. And then we're going to show you two of the major society guidelines, SAGES and the ASGE, that support the use of Strata. Now, before we sort of move onwards from this, I want to be uh, extremely clear like every other um, solution out there, Strata is successful with appropriate patient selection. And we're gonna spend a lot of time today discussing what patients this procedure is targeted for and which patients may not be appropriate for that procedure. So very rapidly, and I'm sure you're all extremely familiar with GERD, the disease state and the problem, most patients with reflux find that medication or lifestyle change can address their symptoms adequately, but about one third of those patients really don't. Uh, and increasingly, we find that patients are concerned about the long-term use of PPIs and H2 blockers, and we find that patients are equally concerned about anatomy altering surgery if they feel that it isn't necessary to address their condition. So an important part of the treatment continuum for GERD needs to be a therapeutic approach that's between that medicative approach and the surgical approach. And we feel that Strata really fits that niche. So it treats the dysfunction of the lower esophageal sphincter that can cause GERD without changing the anatomy or without implantation. Uh, here are kind of the, the greatest hits um, points for 86% of patients off daily medications at four years, 64% of patients off daily medications at 10 years, and I'll show you those studies in greater detail shortly. More than 40 clinical studies, including sham and random uh, controlled trials. It's been proven to be durable in multiple long-term studies, with the longest study being 15 years. Uh, it's also a relatively low cost alternative to surgical options. Uh, and it's an outpatient procedure with shorter recovery time compared to any of the surgical or implantation options. Most importantly, though, it doesn't preclude other treatments. 
So should you have a patient who doesn't respond appropriately to Strata, it's possible to move on to more intensive surgical alternatives. It has a very shallow learning curve, and we find that uh, most new physicians gain proficiency after six cases, if not before, and it has a less than 1% complication rate, with the overwhelming majority of complications being, um, being classified as very minor. Uh, so uh, in most studies, it seems to have a similar complication rate to just performing an, an endoscopy. So let's talk a bit about patient selection, because this really is the key for the um, for a successful strata procedure. On the one hand, for that medicative therapy, we have uh, about 70% of patients who will respond to medication. They typically have mild GERD symptoms, and they typically have a functional lower esophageal sphincter. They tend to be patients who are highly motivated to address their condition. And when we say highly motivated, we mean they're patients who are willing to make dietary changes, lifestyle changes, and who are willing to adhere to a sometimes complex medication regime. Um, they, they don't tend to like uh, needing medication for long-term daily use, but some of them will uh, adhere to that. And they tend to be tolerant of the medication. And what we mean by that is that they don't have side effects to PPIs or H2 blockers, or they don't have unfortunate interactions with other medication that they need to take. And then we have this sort of middle therapy, the radiofrequency treatment, which is the Schroeder procedure. And this is appropriate for, for uh, a huge portion of this continuum, the 25 to 30% of patients who have symptoms that are poorly controlled with medication. Uh, they tend to have mild to moderate GERD, a less than two centimeter hiatal hernia, which is essential, a partial response to medication, um, or they are non-compliant with their PPI routine. Um, we constantly hear reports from our physicians of patients who either are not taking their PPIs appropriately on a daily basis, or who take them at the wrong time related to their meal periods. And because of that, the PPIs don't work the way that they're intended to do so. They can also be intolerant of that long-term medication use, either because of side effects, drug interactions, or because of concerns with long-term conditions that are correlated to long-term PPI use. They can be post-bariatric surgery with GERD symptoms and not wanting an additional bariatric procedure, and we'll discuss that patient set a little later in the presentation, or they can have extra esophageal symptoms of GERD, which is of course an area that our company uh, specializes in. Now, this is a very different patient set than the anti-reflux surgery patient set. And when we talk about anti-reflux surgery, we mean transoral fundoplication, uh, surgically implanted devices such as the links, or laparoscopic missing fundoplications. That's generally kind of that top 5% who are very severe. Uh, and as a, as a general rule, if they need a hiatal hernia repair, then they are not really a Streda patient. They are onto that anti-reflux procedure patient group. Um, they'll have severe GERD, they'll be intolerant of long-term medication, or it just won't work. Maybe they're post strata with uh, GERD symptoms that won't go away, but that is a small percentage, as I'll discuss later on. Uh, if they have late stage erosive esophagitis, uh, they are definitely in that category as opposed to in the strata category, or if their hiatal hernia is larger than two centimeters. There are some restrictions for many of those surgical candidates. For instance, transoral incisionless fundoplication requires a body mass of less than uh, 35 uh, for the BMI, and it, it does further restrict with the hiatal hernia, unlike in this in fundoplication. Of course, with uh, a product like the Lynx as well, you um, have to make sure that the patient is unlikely to need an, uh, an MRI in the near future. So I hope that contextualizes where we see Strata and how it fits in to the other approaches to GERD that are currently on the market. Um, just to recap slightly, with the Strata patient selection, it is very important that they don't fully respond to PPIs, uh, but we, we strongly acknowledge that Strata is the best fit for patients who are partial responders. 
um, who have some symptomatic improvement but not pH improvement or vice versa, uh, or are simply concerned about the long-term risks of PPIs and want to avoid surgery. Um, Non-erosive reflux uh, is strongly preferred in terms of where we see good results. Um, and, you know, just as three kind of groups that we're going to be looking at in a bit more detail, post nissen fund application, post-gastric sleeve or bypass, uh, and of course, certain candidates who are not necessarily appropriate for a stronger surgery. We're continuing to refine our shredder patient selection procedures, and recently several studies have emerged that have helped us to do that. One of them coming out of the UK has even gone so far as to propose a scoring system that shows which patients are more likely to have a very strong series of results uh, than others. And we hope to share those uh, studies with you in due course as you examine which of your patients can benefit from stress. So what might the contraindications be? Well, there are no absolute contraindications to the use of radiofrequency uh, in humans, but there's of course a fairly standard list that we should always consider. Shredder is generally used on patients who are over the age of 18 or adult patients, and that's how it's registered with the FDA. Having said that, there have been several academic uses uh, in which the patients have been younger and the results have been generally positive, but we do consider it to be a product for your adult patients. Pregnant women uh, are ruled out uh, in the specific instance. Um, and of course, patients without a diagnosis of GERD um, we tend to find that many individuals who uh, show up with reflux symptoms will have some sort of mental health condition, including but not limited to anxiety or uh, what we call situational reflux. And of course, those patients are not ideal for a procedure that focuses on improving the muscles of the lower esophageal sphincter and they require very different treatment. If the patient has a hiatal hernia in excess of two centimeters, they are less likely to be successful with the procedure. Uh, the real reason for that is, is quite simple. The balloon inflates to a diameter of about three centimeters, and it's extremely important that the patient has a snug fit of the balloon in their esophagus. So if their hiatal hernia is too large, the needles may not make um, uh, as good a connection as they need to. Uh, achalasia or incomplete LES relaxation in response to swallow, um, Streda can tighten up the sphincter and indeed does, so patients who struggle with swallowing or achalasia can have a difficult time post-procedure, so we tend to deem those to be contraindications. And then of course patients who are generally poor surgical candidates, although that's usually at the discretion of an anaesthetist or other uh, physician. So how does Streda work? Because there's been a lot of questions that surround this. Um, so it provides symptom relief through a functional improvement. The RF energy treats the musculature of the uh, lower esophageal sphincter. Now, this isn't unique to Streda by any stretch of the imagination. As most of you will know, LaserMed has a wide range of products uh, that for a number of years have effectively used similar energy sources to tone um, various parts of the body and to provide um, aesthetic improvements. And this is simply a more functional version of that technology. So how is the function improved? Well, there's a reduction in transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxations. There's an increased barrier against material coming out of the stomach. There's lower acid exposure. There is a thicker esophage a lower esophageal sphincter and there is greater pressure in the uh, esophagus. And that all leads to symptom relief with a strong good quality of life score, uh, lower heartburn scores, lower medication use. And where Strata has really excelled is in patient satisfaction, which of course is very gratifying. And Strata is the only option available that treats the physical cause of GERD, the actual sphincter not functioning properly, without that anatomy altering surgery or providing an implant. So here's a, a nice little illustration of the procedure and how it functions. We use low power RF energy delivered directly into the musculature. And when we say low power, we keep the temperatures extremely low. So the temperature ends up being similar 
So about a very hot cup of coffee. Uh, we do treatments on six different levels, three above and three below the Z line, so that it regenerates the muscle of the lower esophageal sphincter and the gastric cardia. The barrier function improves um, and fewer of those relaxations occur. Now, this improvement does take some time, and we'll discuss that a little later on in the presentation, but the muscle does take several months to regrow. Um, the, we, we have several decent histiological studies to really um, illustrate this muscle regrowth. So the first one was uh, a blinded uh, histiological study, and this was done by Professor Herman and his group. Uh, so I don't know if you can see the, the untreated thinner muscularis propria is markedly different than the muscularis propria that's been given the RF treatment. And I believe this is in a porcine model. Um, and we can also see, and this is from a separate study, the growth in smooth muscle cells uh, that occurs during this process. So we do see a real difference from a histiological standpoint. And if we look at the canine modeling as well that's uh, occurred, we see a very similar function of the increase in thickness of the G junction in the muscularis propria. And this was done by a separate group. So we have that kind of dual analysis. Um, on humans, of course, doing the histiological modeling is, is not quite so straightforward, but we do, using uh, advanced imaging, have excellent examples of what happens after the Shredder procedure and at three months. One of the things, is, as we'll discuss uh, shortly, is that six months, uh, we would expect to see that even improved further. So let's talk about the clinical efficacy of the product. Uh, we've now performed somewhere greater than 30,000 Shredder procedures. We think it's more than 35,000, but we're right on the cusp, so I hate to tell you the wrong information. We've got more than uh, 17 years of data, uh, multiple four-year studies with consistent outcomes, a 10-year follow-up, uh, an eight-year follow-up, more than 3,000 patients studied in clinical trials, and with the newest two studies that came out, I believe that's now uh, closer to 3,500 patients in clinical um, trials. We have good level one evidence with three randomized sham control trials plus one randomized compared to PPIs. Um, the meta-analysis by Ronnie Fass in 2017 put together 28 of these studies and almost 2,500 patients. Uh, and we'll spend a little bit of time with that in a minute. Uh, we also have good medical society support. Uh, I haven't included the NICE support in this PowerPoint from the UK, but we do also have uh, good NICE support um, from the NHS. And of course, just in, as, as a general kind of uh, model, there are over 40 clinical studies out there and the consistency is quite good. The variation that you may see in some Strata studies is based almost solely around patient selection. And there are some studies that have different patient selection than others. So we would strongly encourage you whenever you're reading a study about Strutter to kind of examine which patients were selected and to look at the results on that basis as opposed to uh, as an absolute. For instance, one of the things that happened in the early life of this product is that it was brought to the market as a cure for a wider range of reflux patients. And at that time, they were frequently performing um, uh, this procedure on patients who had hiatal hernias of three centimeters in diameter or more. Naturally, those patients were not successful uh, at the same rate as patients with a two centimeter hiatal hernia. So our protocols have changed and we have seen a large uptick in the success rate of the procedure. Just to have a look at this meta-analysis, however, and I would point out that this meta-analysis does in fact include many of those studies that have three centimeter hiatal hernia guidelines as opposed to only two. So we'll cycle back to that in a moment. It's an extremely large size, high quality comprehensive study. It ranks it in the top 1% of systematic review slash meta-analyses. And the 28 studies and 2,500 patients with an up to a 10 year follow-up does provide an exceptional level of evidence. The average on that is 25 months, which we also feel is significant. Just to give you a quick summary of the results, 
It concluded that there were significant improvements in health-related quality of life scores, significant reductions in heartburn symptom scores. The majority of patients were off proton pump inhibitors. There was significant healing of erosive esophagitis, significant reduction in esophageal acid exposure, and an extremely low adverse event rate of less than 1%. So I don't want to spend too much time on the math and risk not covering um, everything else that we, we'd like to go through in this presentation, uh, but I do think that uh, it is important to consider that um, consider Dr. Fass's conclusion uh, that that patients are actually able to significantly benefit, and that this is across such a wide range of studies. Um, so I'll just skip through. Um, I will be more than happy, by the way, to send this meta-analysis out to any of the attendees who would like to review it in greater detail. Uh, one of the things that has been uh, interesting for us is examining the quality of life score in particular, because this is uh, an area in which patient satisfaction becomes key and can become particularly important as patients choose their procedures more broadly. So this is a 2012 meta-analysis that at that time included 18 studies and uh, almost 1,500 patients. And it concludes similarly to the 2017 meta-analysis. So not only um, have we done the work on a broad range of studies, uh, we've done it at multiple times along the product development. And what we can see along that product development is although the 2017 meta-analysis shows slightly stronger results than the 2012 meta-analysis, that's showing that we have improved the product through its lifespan, and in addition, that we have been able to more effectively select which patients will benefit from this procedure. So on that note, when we look at the recent highlights, and these are two studies uh, that came out more recently, um, this was 50 consecutive Streta patients, and this was performed in the UK, uh, we see that 45 uh, of those 50 patients, or 90%, met their uh, tier one criteria for significant improvement. And of the five that did not, two had comorbidities, and that's a slightly more sort of complicated patient group that we have not been able to, uh, that, that we're never able to guarantee will turn out the way we would like and two others had hernias in excess of two centimeters. No complications were reported over those 50 patients. So this is an example of a significant improvement in patient selection, which has led to, of course, significant uh, treatment improvements. And along that note, uh, this is a, an example of a, a paper that came out at a similar time, 75 patients in this study were, were performed in Dubai um, with uh, Dr. Mazin Al-Jabiri. 75%, oh, sorry, 70 patients were off PPIs at 12 months, 93% uh, of them. And the remaining five patients managed to reduce from EID to PPIs as needed. So we felt that this was an exceptional response to therapy. Once again, we would highlight that in this case, all patients had a hiatal hernia of less than two centimeters, all had demonstrable GERD as opposed to any sort of psychiatric condition that would have contributed, and all of them had been partial responders to PPI. So what this meant is, with the right patient selection, the outcomes were exceptional. So let's discuss patient safety very briefly. Um, we like to show this as a comparison to other products in the marketplace. And what we have seen in this pro uh, in Strata in general is that firstly, it can be for performed under conscious sedation, whereas the other devices uh, require that full uh, anesthesia. Um, it's also quite cost effective compared to the other the other products in the marketplace. It is a product that has been around longer, and the FDA reported adverse events are very minor in comparison to every other solution that's currently being marketed for this particular problem. So if you take nothing else out of this, uh, this talk, uh, please take away that Streda is an extremely safe procedure 
and that, that, uh, that your patients can benefit as a result. So as a safety profile, um, there have been three adverse events reported, which out of 30,000 procedures is so minor. Um, uh, and one of the things that we like to discuss when we talk about those is that all that were investigated were found not to be device related. Um, so obviously, whenever a patient checks into a hospital, there is a degree of risk, but we have worked very hard to minimize that risk. In terms of durability, we are very proud of the durability for the procedure. Now, we like to preface this discussion by saying that there are absolutely two types of patients. There are patients who uh, say to themselves, because I've had the Streda procedure, I can eat whatever I want to eat. I can drink whatever I want to drink. Uh, my reflux will not come back because I have had strata. Unfortunately for those patients, there is relatively little we can do for them if they continue to eat uh, as much as they would like to eat and drink as much as they would like to drink. Uh, but for the patients who are motivated to continue their improvement and who are motivated to resolve their reflux, we tend to have excellent results in terms of the procedure's durability. So this was a uh, moderately sized eight-year follow-up study. Um, and we found that uh, almost 77% were uh, completely off all anti-reflux medication, and the remaining patients only used uh, anti-reflux medication occasionally. And that's something that we do see with patients who have suffered uh, from reflux over the years. Some of them will still have that occasional need but it tends to be associated with exceptional food or drink events. They go out for a large meal, they drink more alcohol than they otherwise would, those sorts of things. And the key finding of this study was that these patients compared favorably with results of the more invasive NIS and fund application surgery. Um, we, uh, one of the nice things about this study is that it did show a four-year follow-up as well as an eight-year follow-up. And of that four-year follow-up, uh, we found that the four to eight were very similar results. So for the patients who do improve on this therapy, it is reliable that those results will last for an extended period of time. And obviously both were uh, much, much better than their initial pre-treatment results. Uh, Marc Noir also performed a 10-year durability follow-up study. Um, and of course, at 10 years, it can get increasingly difficult, uh, particularly with older patients, but his results were overwhelmingly positive. Uh, the notable uh, result was that there was demonstrable improvement in Barrett's esophagus tissue. And in 85% of cases, there was disappearance of metaplasia and dysplasia. Uh, this is something that, that's very important to us. Patients, of course, who are showing symptoms of more severe diseases than GERD, once their GERD is resolved, many of them over time will also heal for some of those other conditions. Uh, of course, they need to be relatively minor uh, to begin with, but the no reported cases of esophageal cancer over a 10 year period in this sort of patient cohort is important and I think effectively demonstrates how uh, effective the procedure can be. And this was a temp uh, this was a 217 patient uh, group. Um, not all of them, of course, uh, were available for each follow-up, um, but it was an interesting study because BMIs were equally represented um, and 72% uh, had extra esophageal reflux. And that's a group that we have had a great deal of success in, whereas many other procedures have struggled more with that LPR grouping. Uh, 18 of these patients, by the way, were uh, Nissen fund application failures at a late stage. And so that was an interesting application of the Streda technology, was to take a patient who had previously received a wrap and have that, um, have that patient uh, kind of improved with, uh, with, these, with this technology. Um, so I'm just looking at the questions for a minute. I seem to have a 
few of them built up. So I'm just going to go back for a second. Um, and I apologize, I didn't see them initially. So in terms of minor motility disorders, it's really going to depend on whether that has to do with gastric emptying or uh, whether it has to do uh, with um, the esophagus. One of the things that we do like to make very clear is, um, sorry, I'm just trying to pop this out so I can see that, that. there we go. Uh, okay, doc, Dr. Schlosser, <laughs> my, my apologies uh, for missing those. Um, so uh, in terms of the minor motility disorders, it's going to depend on exactly how that presents. With it being minor, absolutely. The one thing you have to be careful about is that immediately post-procedure, gastric emptying can be slightly affected. So there is a school of thought that suggests that um, an electrogastrogram is advantageous prior to this sort of procedure, uh, and that depending on exactly what the motility disorder is, um, it, it should be treated uh, with a degree of caution. Obviously, if there is difficulty swallowing, then, then no, we don't uh, recommend it whatsoever. But if it does go through, um, then um, once it's into the stomach, there's no problems uh, using strata for those patients. And certainly it can prevent that material from coming back up into the esophagus. Uh, in terms of reflux hypersensitivity, there's actually a bit of a split on this in the literature. Uh, for some of those patients, if it's not a functional problem with demonstrable reflux, then we have not found that reflux hypersensitivity uh, is a patient population that strata benefits. Um, and in fact, there was a recent study that had a number of patients who had hypersensitivity, but who did not have functional reflux. Um, and uh, with those patients, uh, Strutter didn't, didn't really have a meaningful difference because even if you expand that lower esophageal sphincter and improve the lower esophageal sphincter, they still have that hypersensitivity. So really with Strutter, we're talking about patients who are suffering from good in a much more classical sense. Um, and uh, that, that's, that's, uh, that's really the patient population where we have highest degree of success. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that uh, John and Thomas Fieger um, are able to are able to uh, provide you with the newest study as, from Professor Zwanath as soon as it is released that does talk about uh, kind of finding the ideal mix of anatomical features for the Strata procedure and that may answer some of your questions. Uh, in terms of reimbursement, I'm going to leave my colleagues at uh, LaserMed to uh, provide some further information about the finances. We tend to find it's very country by country specific. But uh, I'm going to go back into the presentation for a moment. Do please keep sending me questions. Um, sometimes it can be a little bit difficult for me to see that they have happened. And then we will, but I'll, I'll periodically go and look at the questions again. Uh, so. Uh, this is actually our favorite example of the procedure uh, that we get from this 10-year follow-up study because it charts medication use and, of course, quality of life scores. One of the things that you can see is that at half a year, the medication scores and the quality of life scores are significantly below what they are pre-procedure, but the best benefit comes at between one and two years. So there are a series of patients for whom the regrowth in lower esophageal sphincter does take a significant amount of time. We tend to find that it takes between three and six months. And then many of those patients, as they have that rebuilt sphincter for a longer period of time, will continue to improve and will continue to, um, to show better and better signs. Now, this is a study we're particularly proud of. This is a 15 plus year follow up study from some of the earliest Shredder patients. It was performed in Puerto Rico. And the key to this study is that none of these patients had evidence of Barrett's or esophageal neoplasia on endoscopy after 15 plus years. So, what that shows very clearly is that Shredder is not simply numbing the nerve endings or not simply addressing 
the symptoms of GERD. It's addressing the acid and stomach material coming up into the esophagus. Uh, so this is a study we, we are very, uh, very proud to have been a part of and to have seen something this long lasting, we feel is extremely helpful. Um, uh, John just asked, uh, asked what the learning curve is for a GIMD. I do actually have a, a training section at the end of this PowerPoint that we'll get to in just a minute and I'll go through the learning curve then. So I'll just uh, speed up a little bit so we have a bit more time for questions at the end. My apologies if this is more detailed than it otherwise could be. Um, now, Strata has a, an almost unique position in the marketplace in that it can work on patients who have gastric sleeves, it can work in patients who have ruin Y bypasses. Uh, there's been a very small scale study um, that was performed uh, by Samir Matar, uh, and he showed using pH monitory uh, that uh, five of his six patients uh, on whom he performed Strata showed significant improvements after an almost two year, after 18 months to two years, um, and that their reflux was almost entirely uh, removed. And these are on patients who had had ruin Y bypasses and then had de novo GERD. So we, you know, th that's a patient population that we can help a great deal. We also think it's very important to consider patients who have had gastric sleeves. Those patients have typically chosen to have a sleeve as opposed to a ruin Y bypass. And many of them are resistant to the idea of converting from a sleeve to a ruin Y bypass. Uh, so we feel that this is a very effective illustration of that study, the reduction in Demista score and the reduction in the fraction time below a pH of four uh, using Bravo uh, is, is quite compelling in this patient cohort. And especially is there a patient cohort for whom there is not that much that can be done. There was also a small scale uh, Duke case series. It was only a couple of patients, but it did show that after gastric sleeves, uh, Strata provided a viable alternative for that patient set. So what about Strata after anti-reflux surgery? Well, uh, I already mentioned the Marc Noir study included several anti-reflux surgery patients. Uh, of those patients, there was a very good success rate showing the uh, quality of life score improving drastically, uh, satisfaction increasing, medication score decreasing, and 50% of the patients who had failed a missing fund duplication and then were given a strata uh, had decreased their medication use by half or more at the 10 year point. So obviously this is a, a slightly difficult patient group, uh, but it does show that there can be significant advantage. A study that more focused on this patient set showed that in the shorter term, and obviously this is about a year follow-up as opposed to a 10 year follow-up, Symptom scores decreased significantly in 85% of patients who had previously had a failed uh, Nissen fund application. So for patients who have struggled after that sort of anti-reflux surgery, Strata can quite effectively uh, provide an alternative to an additional surgery. Um, we have excellent recommendations from SAGES uh, and we have excellent um, recommendations from the ASGE, but let's talk through that training question very quickly. We have a three-stage training program, and of course, in this era of COVID-19, it's not quite as comprehensive as it once was. Uh, the first step, though, is the level one online training, which covers the anatomy, physiology, causes, treatments of GERD, etc., and we can, of course, send access to all of you to that training very rapidly. Uh, and that does, in fact, provide a lot of the pragmatic tools that you would need to perform the procedure. The level two training is a hands-on training with an inanimate model. And we can do that either via video message uh, with one of the laser med team present at your clinic, uh, or alternatively, we can do it as part of a larger training day. And in fact, we, we did the first example of that uh, last January in Switzerland uh, with uh, a reasonable degree of success. The level three training 
is a peer-to-peer -peer training, either in person or via video at one of our designated sites. We tend to use physicians who have performed more than 200 procedures as trainers. And we also have uh, a series of individuals, both in Europe and around the world, who uh, can uh, are kind of product representatives and experts who are able to be physically with you for your first six procedures. We find that after six procedures, a physician has really no need of assistance. It's an interesting procedure because it is very brief. Um, you perform two uh, endoscopies with the procedure, one prior to the procedure and one after the procedure. But the procedure itself in between takes only about 20 to 30 minutes. And so in total, you're kind of in the uh, endoscopy suite for about 45 minutes. We do find that physicians get slightly more rapid with the procedure, partially because their surgical techs or their nursing team uh, becomes a little bit more familiar with how they can best support the physician. So we, we do recommend that for the first few procedures, you book 60 minutes of time, and then that will reduce very rapidly to about 45 minutes of time. It's interesting to us as a group because the biggest complaint we receive from uh, both physicians and from um, uh, surgical techs is that the procedure is boring. It's a very simple procedure. It's a very easy procedure to perform. Uh, and it simply requires repeated steps of inflating the balloon, uh, uh, extruding the needles, uh, applying the radio frequency, and then moving to that next level. Uh, so the training tends to be uh, relatively straightforward. Uh, we don't have um, we don't have any physicians that, that find it difficult or cumbersome. Uh, so it is really a very simple procedure. And uh, I believe in Switzerland, Thomas Fieger will be taking the lead on uh, making sure that that training is completed appropriately. Uh, we, we do have a few more minutes uh, and I'm more than happy to take any questions that you may have uh, about the procedure at this time. If I missed any questions, please go ahead and type them in again and we'll make sure that, that we go through them. Um, but just to recap, we, we have an overwhelming body of evidence that this procedure is safe, effective, uh, and can treat uh, specified patient populations and patient sets. The evidence that is out there or the studies that are out there that uh, seem to show that Stredo is not as effective uh, as the rest of that body of evidence tend to be in patient populations that we do not advise that the procedure is performed upon. So there is a, a range there and we do have some good evidence uh, on the one hand that it works very effectively on certain patients, but on the other hand, we also have that evidence showing patients on whom uh, the treatment simply does not work. Um, and the long-term results from the well-selected patients we feel uh, speak for themselves. Uh, the society guidelines are strongly supportive of the procedure and we feel that it can be of great benefit to Switzerland and to a number of your patients. Uh, so if you have any questions, please do let me know and we'll be very happy to go over them. Did we have any questions? Does anyone have a muted microphone but is trying to uh, ask something? <laughs> uh, uh, a further question about the learning curve. Uh, the traditional model for this procedure has been to uh, 
watch to learn about the procedure, watch the procedure, perform the procedure, teach the procedure uh, in as few as one or two cases. Uh, our preference is to say that there is a learning curve of about six cases, but we don't tend to find that that necessarily will impact on patient outcomes. This is particularly the case as we have been improving our training uh, structures and we have also been improving the protocols for how the procedure should be performed. One of the real keys to this sort of procedure is to slowly inflate the balloon. It's odd to say, but often we get in a hurry and uh, people try and inflate the balloon very rapidly and it doesn't work as well. So we find that the learning curve can be mitigated by having a member of our team present, either via video or in person, and that uh, during those six procedures, you unfortunately may have a Strata expert leaning over your shoulder and saying, uh, you need to inflate the balloon more slowly, please go more slowly. <laughs> but we find that after those first six procedures, the rhythm uh, gets put in place. So the learning curve isn't necessarily about patient outcomes so much as whether you feel comfortable performing the procedure without any technical assistance. And um, one of the other things that we're always happy to do is to give your uh, surgical techs or your auxiliary medical teams training as well, so that they are very familiar with the device, very familiar with how to set it up and how to make it ready for you as you perform those procedures. The, the real key with the learning curve is actually about reduction in the amount of time it takes to perform the procedure as opposed to necessarily patient outcomes. But um, I mean, naturally, as with any procedure, I'm sure you will feel that your best work is performed after several cases as opposed to in the first procedure itself. I came in two more questions. Did you see them? Uh, I did not. Let me pull it out. Um, ah, so uh, when we compare TIFF to Strata, I think that we are talking about very different um, procedures for very different patients. Uh, I don't consider us to be in competition with TIFF. I consider it to be a um, an anatomy altering procedure that is appropriate for patients who have more severe reflux. Uh, Strata is more appropriate for the partial responders to PPIs. TIFF is more appropriate for patients who may need to have a uh, hiatal hernia repair followed by a partial wrap. Uh, there are some downsides to the TIFF procedure that uh, are not a problem for the Strata procedure. Um, most physicians find that they require two physicians to perform TIFF appropriately because of the size of the device itself. Uh, and so they have to work as a team in a way that they may not have to um, do for Strata. So Strata is very low intensity. It's also the patients recover much more rapidly for the patient. I, I can see that there's some uh, questions about, is it painful for the patient? How long do you keep patients after treatment? Uh, so oftentimes we will give the patient something like paracetamol syrup uh, or something similar to uh, provide them some slight pain relief for the, the day after the procedure. But typically patients are at work the next day. Typically they would leave the hospital uh, maybe 45 minutes after they wake up from uh, the anesthesia. We don't see it as being terribly different from uh, an endoscopy or a colonoscopy. So it's, it's a very similar process to that. I, I of course wouldn't say that it's pleasant or it's fun, uh, but what I can tell you is that um, when I have uh, stuck around and chatted with physicians for a few minutes after procedures, I have sometimes met the patient that was on the operating room table in the elevator on the way down uh, to leave the hospital. So uh, it, it is a very rapid process. The patients do go home that day uh, and the patients are typically back to work the next day. We do recommend that the patient uses a liquid diet for a 24 hour period we would further recommend uh, that the patient had a soft diet for several days, just as a precaution. And we would typically find that um, patients should avoid intensive exercise or heavy lifting for a few days surrounding the procedure. 
Uh, but if they feel like they can return to those activities, then doing so in conjunction with their physician is not a problem. Uh, the only thing we worry about is, of course, sudden jerky uh, movements that, that we would worry about after any uh, endoscopic procedure. Um, so, so we do tend to find that, that that Shredder is the most minimally invasive of these approaches. And um, there's a question about how long do you keep patients uh, after Shredder treatment for surveillance in the outpatient clinic? Probably about 45 minutes or an hour. I mean, it's not a long period of time. Uh, what I would say is it can be patient by patient. If you have a patient who is very old or very sensitive, or obviously uh, that can be adjusted, but we have plenty of patients who leave very rapidly after the procedure. Um, in terms of patient pain, uh, there, there should be some discomfort, as we would normally expect, and as there would be after an EGD. Some patients will feel more discomfort than others, and we will also find that, that some patients will uh, have a small amount of pain for several days. A very sore throat is quite common, just where the catheter has been, uh, but we don't tend to find that that uh, causes problems for a long period of time. Generally, that's more a sort of 24 to 48 hour uh, experience for the patient. And actually, we, we've always considered that to be a real strength of the uh, procedure is its ability to um, get patients back to work as rapidly as possible or uh, back to their normal day-to-day -day lives. Wonderful. Am I missing any other questions? Okay, it, it seems like uh, I think I think we've answered uh, all of the questions that there are for today. I, I'd very much like to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, please do be in contact with us if you have further questions offline. I'm always available and happy to respond directly or via uh, Thomas and John. Um, so thank you so much for your time today. Uh, we really look forward to working with you to bring Strata to Switzerland. And um, please, if there's anything that I can do to answer further questions, uh, I will be very happy to do so. Uh, have a wonderful evening and a great week. Thanks.